Tonight I've got an exciting deep sky astrophotography project lined up. I'm going to be shooting the Eastern Veil Nebula in the constellation Cygnus using the camera and telescope you see behind me. The cool thing about tonight is that I'm using a new auto guiding setup for the first time. So a new guide scope and a new guide camera. And it might be useful for those of you getting into auto guiding to see the way I set all that up. Oh man, my neighbor's really hacking away at something with his weed whacker. If you don't remember this telescope, this is the William Optics Fluorostar 132. So it's an F7 refractor with about 950 millimeter focal length, but I've got a 0.8 times reducer flattener on the end of it, bring it down to about 740 millimeters at F5.6. It's all riding on the Skywatcher EQ6R Pro go-to equatorial mount. And the EQ6R Pro is an astrophotography mount I consider to be probably the best mount you can get for the price in its category. Man, this angle makes the telescope look extra huge. A dead giveaway that this system is about at the limits of what this mount can do is the two counterweights all the way at the bottom of the shaft. The payload capacity, the maximum payload capacity for the EQ6R Pro is 45 pounds, but for Astro, you generally wanna keep it a little lower than that. I think this whole thing's probably around 30 pounds. This is the auto guiding setup here. This is the Starfield 60 millimeter guide scope. So just a little refractor with a 220 millimeter focal length at f3.8. And then I've got the ZWO ASI 120mm mini guide camera at the back there. Teeny little 1.2 megapixel sensor, a mono camera. And this whole kit is really affordable. The camera is 150 US and the guide scope's 200 Canadian, which means it's probably like 10 bucks American. One thing you need to consider when choosing an auto guiding system is particularly the focal length of the guide telescope. So this one at 228 will be just fine with my primary imaging refractor at 740 millimeters. There's not so much of a mismatch where it's gonna not guide properly. But if this were a longer focal length telescope, say for example, the Edge HD 11 at the native 2800 millimeters, 228 millimeter focal length for a guide scope, I can tell you is not enough. In that situation, you need to mount a larger guide scope or look into an off axis guider. This little guy is really cute. So it's the inch and a quarter diameter. So it will fit all the miniature guide scopes you've ever seen, just slides right in the back, including the ZWO mini guide scope, that 30 millimeter. All of the 50 millimeter guide scopes and 60 millimeter for that matter that I've used will fit this little guy. And I wasn't kidding when I said it has a small sensor. Look at how tiny that, it's smaller than Ashley's baby fingernail. So a 1.2 megapixel mono sensor, and it's hard to believe that that's all you need to auto guide a robust system like the one you see behind me. On the back of the camera, there's only two connections. That's the USB type C to connect it to your computer, and then the ST4 guiding cable port. So that's exactly how I'll be using it to guide. I'll connect this to my PC, to my USB hub actually, to be exact, and then the SD4 cable goes right in the back. That satisfying click. Ready to go. So the only thing I haven't talked about yet is the camera attached to the back of the telescope, and that is, of course, the Canon EOS RA. The reason for this whole setup behind me is that I crunched the numbers, I looked at the field of view calculators, and this system is the perfect fit for NGC 6992, the Eastern Veil Nebula. It should frame it up just perfectly. Bree, come here, bud. Come here, over here. Come here, come here for a sec. Oh, it's a good boy. Oh, yes. So because I set this mount up today, I need to polar align it properly. I've got the pole master on there to do that. The filter I'm using is the STC Astro Duo Narrowband filter. Now this one's a little hard to find these days and by little hard, I mean impossible. But the reason I'm using this filter is because two years ago in 2018, I shot this exact target. This filter just did an amazing job at getting those two colors in the Eastern Veil Nebula. So if you've noticed that I'm filming a little bit more in my garage, that's awesome because the old videos I was in the garage all the time. And that's because we've got a lot of the 
out of here so there's a little bit more room. I've got a dedicated computer in here and I can use this TV behind me to like show you stuff and show you what's on the screen outside. And uh, it should be really useful for these videos. So we'll use this tonight for sure to show you my settings when setting up the auto guiding system. Hey buddy, what are you doing? And it's hot as if you are someone that's always wanted to auto guide your telescope, tap into auto guiding with PhD2 guiding just to get those longer sub exposures. I'm gonna help you out tonight because I'm gonna be going over this guide camera and guide scope setup, setting it up for the first time and you can follow along exactly with me. The big things that I see a lot of people struggle with is finding focus in that little guide camera and the guide scope because you're doing a one or two second loop and you don't see any stars, but it's so sensitive that just moving it in a few millimeters can be the difference between completely out of focus and pin sharp. So what you'll be doing to actually focus these little guide cameras is, well, some of these guide scopes have a little helical focuser like this one. So when I turn this, it's actually going in and out very slightly, which is perfect because that's the level of fine tuning you'll need to focus the guide camera. Alternatively, and this is usually what I do, you can just um, unlock it and then move the whole camera in and out of the guide scope until you find it. And while you're doing this, you'll need to actually be looking at a live feed of your guide camera through the guide scope and watching for those sharp stars. And you know, you could be way off, you could be, you could need extension tubes. I've had that before where I've needed to be out here. There's a bit of a discovery process there and uh, you'll wanna look into that beforehand because you don't wanna be stuck out there without the right extension tubes. If you haven't used the QHY Pole Master before, this is kind of what the user interface looks like. On the screen here, you can see Polaris. I just set the center axis on the mount. And then after that, it's gonna be a matter of lining up these alignment stars around the North Star. And then the Pole Master will tell me which direction to move the alt as base of the mount in. So I'm perfectly polar aligned. Now, why am I talking about the Pole Master and polar alignment in an auto guiding video? because if you're not properly polar aligned, your auto guiding is not gonna work. So that's what you need to start with. Polar alignment and balance are key, or don't even bother auto guiding. So this telescope setup is all ready to go. It's polar aligned and it's star aligned and it's currently pointing at the bright star Vega. Now it's time to actually focus the guide camera and the guide scope and actually test the auto guiding function of it. Okay, so leading up to this moment here, what I've done beforehand is downloaded and installed the PhD2 guiding open source software. So you can download that for free online, just Google PhD2 guiding. Also, you need to download the drivers and the software for the guide camera that you're using whether it's an Altair or a ZWO or a QHY, whatever it is, the website for the camera company will have the software and the drivers that you need. You'll need to download all those, as well as the ASCOM platform, which is just a communication language that a lot of this astronomy software uses to communicate with devices. So all of that's been downloaded. As well, when you first set up PhD2 guiding, it'll take you through the setup wizard where it actually understands the camera you're using. You can set up and save a profile. And I've done that for this ZWO ASI 120mm Mini. I'm going to open PhD2 guiding. And then this is the connect button here. It looks like a little USB cord. This is the equipment profile that I talked about. This was the one that I quickly set up. The camera from the drop down is the ZWO ASI camera. Now that option is there because I've installed the correct drivers and software and I can connect the camera. The mount, because I'm using the ST4 cable, is gonna be on camera. So both things are connected here and I can just close this. And then this is the little icon showing begin looping exposures. So it's set at 1.5 seconds. It's gonna do a live loop of what the camera's seeing and it might be way out of focus. And yes, it certainly is. So you might be surprised at uh, you know how little it takes of movement to get from that totally blown out star to a sharp one. That's Vega, so it's an extreme example. Let me first try the helical focuser and we'll see how that goes. So every 1.5 seconds, it's taking a new exposure, which is pretty quick, nearly you know video speed. 
So as I go out, it's getting smaller, which means I just need to move the camera out. I'm gonna actually physically slide the camera down. It wouldn't take much to be so far out of focus that I just see nothing on the screen. You can control the brightness of the screen using the screen gamma. And I've already, ha I already have it pretty bright, but I like it somewhere around here actually. And why don't I just reduce that to one second to just get a quicker loop to fine tune the focus. The great thing is once you find focus and you're, you know, don't plan on changing configurations for your guide scope, you can leave it set and it will just be focused the next time you use it. And now the next step is to actually slew to our target and then start the calibration process there. The telescope is slewing to the Eastern Veil Nebula. So for now, we're gonna do a live loop. We're roughly on our target. And then I'm gonna hit this button here, which is the auto select star. It's gonna choose a star with the appropriate saturation to use as a guide star. I'd rather choose this one that's just a little less close to the edges of the screen. And then we're gonna hit the begin guiding button, which will, because we haven't calibrated yet, it will calibrate first. So you'll see this notification down here. It's gonna do west step, east step, north, and south. And basically what it's doing is it's talking to the mount, moving it very slightly. It's sending pulses to the mount and nudging it in the direction that it needs to. Okay, what you're looking at here is the PHD2 auto guiding graph and people obsess over this thing. So the blue line is the right ascension and the red is the declination. Those are the subtle pulses being sent to the mount based on the movement of that star, that guide star you've selected and calibrated on. The smoother this graph, the better. You wanna see it flat line like a dead patient at the hospital. The big thing to notice here is the total RMS error. There's, a, there's the RA, DEC, and total. You want that to be under 1.0, under one second of error. Don't obsess over this. This graph looks pretty rocky, but it's actually guiding just perfectly. Don't obsess about this. You'll go crazy trying to get it perfect. This is good. And a lot of things come into play, a lot of factors, like the transparency and the seeing, and of course the focal length of the guide scope you're using in your settings. But this is a good graph. And now I'm just gonna switch over to uh, my target on uh, astrophotography tool. The important thing you wanna look for here is that you have the dithering turned on in your image acquisition software, which in my case is astrophotography tool. So you're gonna see that information up here. I'm just gonna go into the gear tab and there's this button that says guide. And if you can see it there, there's guiding program, PHD2 guiding, auto dithering on dithering distance one. That's very important. So dithering shifts the image frames in between the exposures, which really helps when you stack your final image to remove noise. I'm gonna start my imaging sequence plan and boy, is it gonna be exciting when I see that first four minute sub exposure appear on the screen. I find that people like to debate the best practices for the technical aspect of this hobby. I understand they're trying to help, but don't let that get you discouraged or confused. When it comes to astrophotography, I think a picture is worth a thousand words. So let that be the ultimate judge.